Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Everyday Strong with Dr. Michael G. Daniels. This is your host, C.B. Baker. We got another great one today. Um, today's title is The Light at the End of the Tunnel. I believe, Dr. Daniels, that we may be seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. Everything that's going on now, the protesting is really making some waves and actually getting people to make decisions executive decisions, yes. people in high powered positions with authority able to make change. Mm-hmm. Confederate statues are coming down. The the um, NASCAR has banned the Confederate flag from their races. And, it, you know, it's people that was upset about that. Cause, you know, NASCAR is deeply rooted in the South. That's that all day long. Right. Mm-hmm. Which, which I think they're going to find out that black people will go to those races. Yes. And they're going to I think they're going to have a windfall. That's my prediction, but that's a whole nother subject. Mm-hmm. But so light at the end of the tunnel. Do you feel like I mean we can see it Dr. Dan, I can see it, mm-hmm. but are we going to get there? You know, I we I can see the light. Um I'm kind of like the, the 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 young lady on Poltergeist, you know, she said, "Don't don't go into the light." <laughs> you know, I I can see the light. But but I must say there I do have some fear, you right. know. Uh, you know there, you know. Sometimes you have like a a, a boomerang effect, you know. It's kind of like in in, in two thousand eight, you know, when I, I was up uh, at, at at three o'clock in the morning and CNN said um, it's official. Uh, we've had the first African American president elected, uh, Barack Obama. Right. And, and I said to myself, I see the light at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> right. you know, and I thought we were like 50 yards from the end, you know, and then 2016 hit and, and I realized that they had put a cap on the tube and, yeah. and blocked out the rays <laughs> so I couldn't see anymore through the tunnel. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, that's how it feels that way though. You know, it feels like we are on that, on the precipice of, of, of real change. Um, because there's a generation, I think that's what makes me feel so good about it, is that there's a generation of young people that up to this point had been silent mm-hmm. because for them, they had not experienced it. You know, if you were in your 20s, you know, you, you, you didn't understand Jim Crow. You know, mm-hmm. you didn't experience all that kind of right. stuff. Uh, and so when they go to college, the, you know, you sat beside, a, you know, the white sat beside a black. And, you know, it it, right. it wasn't a whole lot of difference for them. It wasn't like when when I went to a college, when I went when I left the HBCU and went to a, another school, I would be the only black in my class for just about every class. Right. So, but for them, it's not like that. But now, even though they, they feel equ- equality, even though they are comfortable dating each other, interracial dating, interracial marriages, now they understand that just because they themselves may see it, that that intrinsic racism still exists. And that generation, I don't think it's going to let it go. So that's what makes me feel good about it. Yeah, I, I feel I feel optimistic about things, about where we're going. And I feel like um, the changes that's going to be made, even if you tried to roll back some of them, mm-hmm. the statues are down. Right. The, the flag is banned in, in NASCAR. You know, it's so that when so you now you shouldn't be seeing the flag just sold in stores just just to be sold, right? You know, and um, so that's real change that you know now when we get the police reform, like the national database for you know police that are just being uh, doing bad things and then you know, possibly not being rehired. Mm-hmm. You know, now we gotta go to the next step with that. It's like okay, now if you knew this person had this report and you hired them anyway. Now we gotta look look at you, right? Right. So, but now we starting to hold people accountable for things, and that's all we've really been, and generally just asking for: hold people accountable for their actions, mm-hmm. for what they're doing. So I definitely can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and I feel you on two thousand eight. Two thousand eight for me, I was like, now I'm I'm going to. I will say this: I will stand on my word. I always said. Barack Obama wasn't a form of slave ancestry for here in America. That's right, true. He in was America. not. He was not. So I was proud when I saw Michelle Obama 
mm-hmm. because she is, you know, right. from she here. Is, she is descended from slaves. Right. And that's, that's the one I, when I think that happens, when you get somebody from slave descent mm-hmm. in America, mm-hmm. I'm not taking nothing away from Barack Obama. Right. He's, he, he's still, procl- he, unlike some interracial marriages, he says I'm black. Right. You know. I feel like when we get to that point, which I do believe of Michelle Obama, uh, please, Michelle Obama, please run for president pretty soon. <laughs> you know, I believe if she ran for president, she would win, hands down, be a landslide. Well, absolutely. You know, now whether or not she wants that, because I mean, she's going to catch pure hell when she's in office. And I think that's part of, part of the reason why she's, if she doesn't do it, that would be the reason why she's not going to do it. Mm-hmm. So if the light, if we're going to get there, how do you, what country do you see us being once we're out of the tunnel? We see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. We're out of the tunnel. What do you see that? What is your image of that? You know, I, I got to tell you, um, my imagination is not that great. <laughs> I'm just being, you know, I, I'm, I'm being honest because... <laughs> The laws, and I, you know, I mentioned this too. I had a meeting the other day with um, one of the uh, state delegates and one of the state senators, and I said, you know, you can change a law, but changing a law don't change an attitude. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it just doesn't change the attitude. And people can treat you within the law and still treat you in a way that's not just, you know, right. You know, for example, a policeman has a lot of latitude. You know, even, let's say there is, let's say they don't, they don't um, use the chokehold, right? But he has a lot of latitude. A policeman can pull me over and he can write me a ticket mm-hmm. or he can arrest me. Mm-hmm. That's the latitude he has. Right. He, we'll let you go. Right. He, right. He can do either, either one of those three things. Write me a ticket is to keep the courts, you know, from overloading the courts and overloading the jails, right? Right. So if if attitudes aren't changed, what would stop a policeman from rather than giving me a ticket, arresting me? Right. Because on that piece of paper, it says you was arrested. Right. Right. So he could take me down and take me and lock me up. Right. You know, and I'll give you an example of that happening, you know, is that when I was younger, my my my, my two brothers and I we're traveling from Norfolk to Durham. And my oldest brother did not have his driver's license. You know, he was speeding, got pulled over, did not have his driver's license with him. Well, rather than give him a ticket, they locked him up. Wow. You know, and so, but they had the latitude to say, here's a ticket, you right. know, and they still could have said you can't drive. Right. They, didn't have to, they didn't have to incarcerate him right, right. You know, for that reason. So, you know, uh, I mean, I, I see the light, but I, I kind of feel like this. Um, and I use a biblical reference. Um, when the children of Israel left Egypt land and they went contrary to what God asked them to do, he said, you're not going to get to the promised land until this entire generation dies off because your memory of what evil lurks in hearts won't leave until you're dead. And and I think sometimes that change will only happen when all those people who are racist in nature Mm -hmm. are dead. I think a generation will have to die because in my lifetime, you still will have people that will be be, um, not just resistant, but mad that the statue came down. Yeah. I, I I agree with that. Even with their, you can even say even with their kids, you know, because they're seeing that their parents is upset, mm-hmm. you know, over things. And it's like, why are you upset? And they're telling them it's all falsehoods that they're saying, but they're blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And now they got that embedded in the head. And then that's what you always hear the white people be like, I, you know, I had no idea. You know, like the yeah. ones that like they wake up like, yeah, y'all not that. You know, they even when them saying it is still racist. It's like y'all not that bad. Mm-hmm. But I, I get it. it's like you've been brainwashed mm-hmm. to thinking that every black person is a criminal, right? You know, right. or or the 
bare minimum a bad person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's that fear. You know, I I, I, you know, I give you an example, with another example. You know, about um, a couple of years ago, Virginia Beach had a, a uh, town hall meeting to, deter- to, to, to survey people to see whether or not they had support to take down the Confederate statue or to relocate it, you know, those kind of things. Now, there was, there was a gentleman that was there that was an instructor, a history instructor at Old Dominion University, and he got up and said this. He said, my colleagues won't, don't agree with me on this, but they don't know what they're talking about. He said, you all think that the Confederate means slavery, but it does not. The, the Civil War was not fought over slavery. The Civil War was fought over states' rights. Said, so why are you all so upset just because you're black and it's, it's a Confederate statue? Well, that was um, the dumbest thing I ever heard. See, there are still people who want to rewrite history and act like it wasn't fought over slavery. Right, right. Because in the declaration for, for, for the separation, it clearly states the right to own slaves. Right. Now, it's true that that was a state right, but the state right they was fighting for was the right to own slaves. Slaves. The irony of that too is this: that General Robert E. Lee saw the foolishness of memorializing statues and using the flag. In fact, at his funeral, he said, "Do not bury me in my Confederate uniform. Do not use that Confederate flag, and do not put up statues to me." And fortunately, his daughter, you know, did what he asked. When he was asked to come and give a speech where they had erected a statue. He said, no, he wouldn't do it because he said, if you keep putting up statues and doing those things, the nation will stay divided. Right. So he understood the, the, you know, that we don't, we, if you do that, the wounds will not heal. Um, I'm afraid that those people who have tried to rewrite history, you know, like when you're driving down 58, I don't know if you notice this, when you're driving down 58, there is a big sign you know, that talks about the Confederacy and it says, if you don't, you know, that you, if, if you think this was only about slavery, then you don't know your history, you know, something along those lines, right? Those type of people will keep teaching people that it's fake news. Yeah. It's, I, I, I want people to know history. Mm-hmm. When I'm, you know, in Virginia driving around, you see the little um, Confederacy little shops. Now, I don't go in there. Right. But right. I get it. If you want to go and learn about your family and, you know, your great, great uncle who fought in the Confederacy, yeah, fine. Go right ahead. I have mm-hmm. no I have no qualms again. Actually, I encourage it. Like, go. If, if they're teaching them true history. Right. If you teach them true history. They also teach them about how the black soldiers came down and then, you know, helped. Wipe y'all out, you know. Throw that in right. there. Right, but don't. <laughs> if you teach them, if you teach them that you're heroes, you're teaching them a lie. Right. Because the losing um, uh, army has never labeled heroes. Yeah. Never. I've never heard anyone say that the Japanese were heroes during not World what, War Two. Not until recently when they start making movies uh, along with the country of Japan. I uh, know, but they, 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 they don't. I've never heard somebody say the Kamikaze pilot was a hero. Yeah, no. not, not to America. I mean, no. I, I never, yeah. I've never heard Amer- an Amer- I'm not talking about what they say in Japan. Right. I'm saying I've never heard, heard an American <laughs> right, say right, right, the right. Kamikaze pilot was a hero. Yeah. You know, because they fought against us. I've never heard an American say right. that Adolf Hitler was a hero. No. I've never heard him say that. I've there there are no statues in 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 the United States of of Hitler saying to our fallen heroes. No, there are no statues in the United States to a Nat Turner saying to our fallen heroes. Right. Right. Generally speaking, when you fight against a country, they consider that to be treason. Yeah. They're generally speaking. So they're not heroes. No. They committed treason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm in total agreement with you. You know, it's. Yeah. So, So, you know, but go ahead. Go ahead. So on the. My view of the light is in the tunnel is I feel like we'll get out of the tunnel. I mm-hmm. feel like it's going to be cloudy outside. You know, that's, that, that's uh, uh, I, I agree 100%. <laughs> we, 
once we get out, it's going to be cloudy. And it may be even raining mm-hmm. hard, you know. It's, and I just hope that it's not one of the situations like when you're in Boston. If you've driven in Boston ever since they uh, redone all their tunnels, you get out of one tunnel to go right back into mm-hmm. another tunnel. Mm-hmm. I just hope it's not like that. It, it, but it very well could be where if you need a whole generation to die off, yeah. then I might be old, you know, in my 70s and 80s before I see, you know, things really, the skies open up and, and the clouds dissipate, right? You know? And, and I'll, I'll tell you why I say that is because not only do not only are there whites that think that blacks are inferior, but almost every other culture, because of how we have been portrayed, thinks we are inferior. <laughs> you know, so and not, and not to mention black people themselves, right? So see, the a- Asians also, you know, I'm not I'm not saying all of them, you know, but I'm right. saying the Asians too feel that way. The, the 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 Latinos feel that way, you know. So you got, uh, and not, I'm not again individually. They, all of them may not, but the Latinos are afraid of black folk, you know, in general. Right. Asians are afraid of black folk in general because they all have this. All, all of them, when you have when you don't have a lot of information, you lean to a stereotype. Yeah. And, and so that's what they do. And they may have a friend that they say, you know, well, I got a black friend. He's okay. But if they don't know you. That, that suspicion is there. Right. But see, a white man you could not know, and they don't think that he is bad. Right. That's why white men get so can can flim flam people so easily. Mm-hmm. And people will wonder, how could he do that? Because if you're a white male, they trust you. Right. If you're a black male, they always are suspicious of you. Right. And that is the pure definition of white privilege. Absolutely. If you're a blonde white female. You know, you're looked upon as being the victim. Right. I don't care what happened. So, you know, and because of that, I, th- like, I agree with you. That's why I say it's going to be some clouds now. You know, we, 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 we will progress, but it's going to still be some cloudy days. It's going to still be some thunderstorms. And then the sun going to come out. And then the rain going to come as well. Right. Switching gears here a little bit, um, our president, Donald Trump, police reform press conference. I don't know why he buried this information in there, but he made an announcement about giving more money to HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And he basically said that he met with them last year, gave them money Mm -hmm. and he came back and he's like, why are y'all back again? So we got to do this every year. So he said, okay, how about I end this and let's extend it out and give you a lot more money to where you don't have to keep coming back every year. Mm -hmm. That was huge news mm-hmm. for the HBCUs. Right. So now I'm going to ask this question. And now that everything is getting is leaning pro-black. Right. All right. Are HBCUs still necessary? No. Mm. Why? Because if I'm going to be in a world of equality or equity, then everyone has to be treated the same. Okay. So the uh, uh, HBCUs should be treated like any other state institution. You know, now some of them are state institutions like Norfolk State, for example. Right. Uh, but then you have Hampton that is not. Right. Right. So if, if Harvard has to stand on his own two feet, then Hampton should have to stand on his own two feet. Um, and, and let me let me also say why I think um, why Donald Trump kind of stay under the radar with that gift to, to black <laughs> okay. institutions because he did not want to offend the white nationalists that support him. That's why I think he did it. Yeah. Okay. Now, what I do applaud, is, you know, when you talk about HBCUs, I do applaud. I don't know if you if you saw this on the news, but um, the um, CEO of Netflix gave $120 million to HBCUs. He gave $40 million to Spelman, um, $40 million to, um, um, join a minute, the, the sister college, I can't. Morehouse. Remember. Morehouse, thank you. Well, I should say the brother college, brother college but right. yeah, but I guess you all call college sisters, but right. yeah. $40 million to Morehouse, $40 million to Spelman, and $40 million to um, the Negro College Fund, right? 
Uh, and he said he and he said he would not have advertised it because he wanted to be un, you know undercover, and he specifically told them not to name any scholarship after him, but he wanted to be able to do get you know so kids can have full rides. Right. But then he said he thought to himself that if he publicized it, then other philanthropists who are white who normally give those huge sums of money to white colleges would then contribute. To black colleges, and and so that's why he did it. Uh, to me, that's another light, you know, in the right. tunnel. Because if he's doing that, you know, right, right. someone someone is going to come back and say, well, you know what, it, you know, of course. And he said it was a drop in the bucket, and what he said was true. It is a drop in the bucket because there's only two schools, right, right, uh, plus to the you know Negro College Fund. So maybe someone will adopt Hampton. Maybe someone will adopt Norfolk State. Maybe someone you know will adopt you know Florida A and M or right. you know A and T. And, and, and that will keep them on a level playing field. But I really do feel that if it's really going to be equity, that at some point, you know, the support for, for HBCUs should come from HBCU graduates. Yeah. You know, because that's who supports the other colleges for right. the most part. Right. If they have prominent graduates, those graduates give back. You know, um, I'm an ODU graduate. I give back to ODU every year, you know. And but I also look at the average gift, you know, that from o, to ODU. Oh, I'm in the bottom one percent, yeah. <laughs> right? You know, of giving, and I give liberally. And I, you know, when I talk to people to go to Norfolk State that I know, and I ask them, well, you know, do you give back in, as an alumnus? They're like, well, why would I do that? You right. know, why would I do that? It's a public school, but they need your money. Yeah, yeah. I was watching um, School Days with my wife about two months ago. And, you know, that question had come up in there. And for everybody that's watching, if you see two helmets, two college helmets on my desk, it's Oklahoma, I played three years at Oklahoma and played one year at Southern University. I graduated from Southern University. So I'm very well versed in the differences between <laughs> predominantly white schools and HBCUs. Right. Now, my issue with HBCUs is the mindset of we're not a predominantly white school. Mm -hmm. So therefore we don't get, we can't, we can't do certain things, but that's a mindset. You can control whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll often tell people about how, when prayer view got taken over by Texas A&M, mm -hmm. like the school changed overnight mm -hmm. and, you know, people in Texas was upset, you know, they was you know, around there protesting and everything. I was like, this is going to be a great thing for mm -hmm. prayer view. Absolutely. You know, and Prayer View went on to do, you know, great things. I agree. The money that people don't give to HBCUs, in my opinion, for one reason and one reason only. They don't trust where the money's going. That's probably true. <laughs> but it, then it goes back to what we has mentioned earlier, where I said that black people don't also have the stereotype of other black people and we hold it against ourselves mm -hmm. because the same black people that I know that went to Oklahoma University mm -hmm. giving money to back to Oklahoma University as alumni. Well, and that's true. Now, I would say, I know, I, I look at, you know, I went to ODU, which was at the time when I went, was predominantly white. You know, it's probably at that time maybe... 95% white, you know, and 5% minorities. Now it's different. You know, it's probably maybe 75, 25. My sisters went to um, HBCU. I've never heard them say that they, on a regular basis, give back to that HBCU. Um, I, I think a part of it is because we just, we're not, our culture we doesn't push us to do it. So if you didn't go to a school where it's a part of their culture, right? You, you know, you didn't kind of adopt that spirit of giving, because a, a lot of people that go to HBCUs go off of grants. You yeah. know, they, they 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 go because they were given money by the by the right. government, right? To go, and so, and so they don't look at it like I need to contribute back because they're thinking, well, everybody's going to get money to go from the government anyway. Right. They don't think about that there are scholarships that need to be dealt with. You know, everybody. It goes to an HBCU, doesn't go because they are a great athlete, you know. And some people want to go to an HBCU, but their parents make enough money 
so that they can't get a grant, but not enough money that they can afford to pay for that full tuition. Right. You know, so we don't really think, I think, that way about, like you say, the culture. I like what Hampton did, though. You know, Hampton has redefined their mission, you know. So Hampton looks at their mission not just as being a institution of education. Uh, and that's why you think about what they promote more. They promote their proton therapy yep. unit more than they promote anything else. Yeah, that's right. You know, Hampton University is a business model that I think all HBCUs ought to kind of look at. So is so all the other HBCUs was born out of alka culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so did them not focusing on that hurt them? You know, the pharma industry kind of just lowering, you know, taking a, a dip? Well, yeah, I think it's, yeah, you, you got to, you know, I, I look at A&T, right? right. Uh, which is in my, near my hometown. And most of my, my, my high school, you know, classmates, they went to A&T, either A&T or North Carolina Central University. I, you know, when my high school um, counselor or mentor, when he told me to go to A&T, he told me I should major in automotive mechanics. And I said to him, well, I don't want to work on cars. Right. I want to design cars. I want to be an engineer. And he was saying, well, fool, you, you, it's not just cars. If you understand it, you know, that, you know, you can work in factories, you know, fixing those machines in the road. Da, 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 da. I, I want to design them. I don't want to be right. the one getting my hands into them. I, so I think that's a part of, like you said, the, the mentality that we, that we, that we have when, oftentimes when we go to schools mm -hmm. is that um, the farming industry um, certainly is, is automated and it's all those things. But we, our focus should be more on technological advances, you know, so, you know, those kind of things that, that we, we will drive our future. If we were going to focus on farming, we should focus on, you know, hydro, hydro farming. It should have been on how do you convert um, uh, plant life to fuel, you know, energy, you know, and things like that so that what you do could be replicated. You know, you get, could be getting grants from the federal government to do research, you know, all those kinds of things that traditionally HBCUs don't tend to do. Yeah. So that, um, now with, the one big push that's happening now is a lot of people are calling for, you know, the predominantly black athletes that are good and these five, four and five star athletes that's in high school that's coming out to start picking HBCUs to play there. Mm -hmm. So the money's going back, you know, because eventually when they're playing mm -hmm. and they're good, those teams will then rise up the ranks, mm -hmm. more money comes into school. It's helping programs and things like that. So on that aspect of it, I totally, I agree with that HBCUs. I'm not agreeing with you. I'm, I'm saying that HBCUs are needed mm -hmm. because I've seen what happens at the predominantly white schools to the black athletes. Mm -hmm. Like it's really, you get treated as if you're only here because you're athletic. But are they? Oklahoma? I'm just telling you from no, my experience. No, I'm saying, right. But yeah. is that the only reason why they're there? No. Some of them, yes. Well, then they're getting treated like they are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See, this is how I look at it. But again, you know, never, never played college sports. But here's what my mother always taught me. Here's what I was taught when I was in school. Nobody can take what's in your head from you. That is true. They can't do that from you. Whether you go to an HBCU, whether you go to a, uh, a Harvard, one plus one is still two. The Pythagorean theorem doesn't change because of what college you go to. Right, that's right. So if, if, you, if you go to Oklahoma, let's say, and they treat you like a commodity, well, that, that's you who, that, that don't mean you have to treat yourself like a commodity. Right. You know, you can still be an engineering major, right? Right. right. You can still be a pre-med major, they don't tell you what you can major in. They may tell you, well, you know what? You got to practice this and this and this and this. And so it would be easier for you if you majored in basket weaving. Right. But that's your, still your choice. Right. If you, if, you, if, you know, if you do it or not. So, again, I'm, I'm not saying that SH, 
I'm not saying that historically black colleges should be, you know, should be vanquished from the earth. What I'm saying is at some point in time, if you really want equity, right. you, you can't keep saying, give me a handout if you want to be treated as equal. Because if, right. if you become a slave to the system, I guess is a, is a point I'm trying to get across. Yeah. You know, you don't want to become a slave to the system. You want to be able to work the system so it benefits you, so people see you as equal. If, if, if all I do is live off welfare all my life, I can't be mad and say the man. Right. You know, the right. man won't let me rise up. Well, I chose not to rise up. And so that's what I say. Um, no matter whether you go to ODU or whether you go to Norfolk State, and it's true, and I'll say this because I, you know, I know it's true. If you go to ODU and Norfolk State, your chances of getting a job are better if you went to ODU. Oh, yeah. Okay, your choice. But, but once you get in the job, your rise has nothing to do with what college you went to. I agree with that. No one asked me at one, every, never at a, at, a, <laughs> at a promotion did anyone ask me what college did you go to. What they looked at was performance. Yeah. And if you if you are a good performer, it doesn't matter what college you go to. Let me ask you this question. Do you think uh, between Norfolk State and ODU, what do you think, who networks better? ODU, absolutely. So, and I would say that, uh, uh, you know, across the board, generally for HBCUs, why do you think as black people we don't network as well? We, I, I wish we were like crabs in a basket, but we are not. Now, people always say we're like crabs in a basket, but we really are the opposite as crabs in a basket. Okay, explain, please. Okay. In, in, in the wild, crabs understand the value of numbers. <laughs> That's why they, you know, they hatch all at the same time, you know, right. generally speaking, because the more that they are, the more chance they have for survival. <laughs> Okay. That's how crab. That's that's nature, right? right? So when you see a crab leaving, getting out the basket, and 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 someone and grabs on to him, that's because the crab doesn't want to go out by himself. So he's he says, when I go out, I'm pulling you out too, and the next one will attach on because I'm pulling you out too. So because all of us can get out, get the out the basket. See, we've looked at it like he's trying to hold a, hold the crab in the basket. He really isn't. The crab that's going out first is saying, I need y'all to come out with me. Because if all of us get out there, we have a better chance of survival. Right. And he's also saying, no crab left behind. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so essentially what's happened is a lot of, some crabs have gotten out of the basket, but didn't pull anybody out. And the people that's in the basket is complaining about the one guy that did get out. Because we, in, in, in my, my experience when I was at Norfolk State was that there wasn't a sense that there was a network out there that would pull you out, to pull you up, right? Right. At ODU, it, that, that the sense I got was we have all these alumnus that are business leaders, you know, in different places. And you know what? You know, we're going to introduce you to these people at these job fairs. Right. So they know you are a graduate. So in their minds, I know what you know because I was here too. We don't necessarily do that at historically black college, at least didn't when I was there anyway. That's not how we did things. Uh, the other thing is when I look at is the um, uh, the alumni chapters. I look at how ODU alumni chapter operates. Look at how Norfolk State alumni chapter operates. Now, I am a member of a Norfolk State chapter, and I'm not a member of an ODU chapter, but I know how they operate because they don't exclude me. So even though I'm not a member, they never exclude me on stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different ball game in how they do business. You know, and, and the information they send out. You know, ODU sends out uh, periodically, they send out these um, um, kind of like, you know, magazines, um, updates and things. Not only do they have everything that's updated about ODU, they have a listing in there of all the ODU alumnus, okay? And, and also, and they highlight different alumnus to talk, you know, about their careers and where they are. Right. So you know who to call. You know how to contact. <laughs> right, you know, right. So you know, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, this person is doing X, Y, Z. So you, you get that kind of information. I can go on the ODU website and log into the alumni thing, and I can see all the people. Right. You know, North State alumnus, I don't, I haven't been told about that kind of stuff. Well, as a matter so, of fact, it was like, what you got me <clears throat> up here for? Right. So, that, see, the networking is different because I can network just through ODU's alumni, you know, through the – um you know, the, the uh, login and, and, and through the application. North State isn't like that. So, that's, I mean, that's a huge difference in, you know, how I can reach out and be known and this kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I said my experience is white schools networking is much, much better. Yeah. yeah. I, I can 
agree with that because I still network now with people that went to school with at Oklahoma, mm-hmm. and people that I went to school with at Southern barely even talked to. I would have to literally pick up. I would have to forcefully, mm-hmm. you know, get on Facebook and then go hit them up. It's not one of the like a free flowing conversation where you talk, you know, once every couple months. Right. I mean, like I say, I get emails from ODU, and you know, it's, it's been a quite a few decades since I've been in ODU. <laughs> right. You know, but I'm getting emails. You still get emails. I'm getting emails from. Them. I still get communication from them. I still get letters. I still get the annual. I get all that stuff I get. I've I I got nothing from Norfolk State. Not one thing have I gotten from Norfolk State. Not one email. Nobody's ever tried to find me on email. I haven't got not one thing. Now, if ODU found me, I wonder why Norfolk State couldn't find me. I'll even say this. I went to Tidewater Community College before I went to ODU, right? It was a long time ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> even they still send me information, and that's a community college. So, you know, the, the culture, I think, kind of hurts us as well. Right. Well, you got anything else to bring up before we close out? Well, it's just always a pleasant uh, 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 opportunity and, and to, to folk. And I'm just going to say to people, listen, this is an important time. As you mentioned, the light at the end of the tunnel. If we want that light to shine, then everybody who has not registered to vote needs to register to vote. Everybody who knows somebody who has not registered need to get them registered. And you need to vote. Don't stay at home and say, like we did last time, right. well, I'm not going to vote because I don't want to vote for the Democratic Party. Listen, a non-vote is a vote. Yep. So get is. out there and vote. And get up early to go vote. Vote early and vote often. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. This is your host, C.B. Baker. Till next time. Peace.